Hello and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Bachner. Once again, it is Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA. And I'm here with someone who at this point really needs no introduction, uh, Dr. Tony Fauci. Tony is Director of NIAID. And along with Vivek Murthy, who's President Biden's nominee to be Surgeon General, and Rochelle Walensky, who has been appointed to uh, head the CDC, uh, those three individuals are the physician leadership of um, President Biden's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome, Tony. Thank you, Howard. Good to be with you. So as usual, so much to discuss, so much news. But I wanted to start with what I think is actually encouraging news. Uh, for the last two weeks, uh, we've averaged about a million point three, a million point five, over a million uh, vaccines delivered a day. Right. Um, I think uh, I know Andy Slavitt has uh, now has some relationship with the Biden uh, administration. I, I think we can anticipate that that will increase in the in the coming months. About thirty or thirty two million people. Where 32, 32, 33 million immunizations have been given. Obviously, it could be a few less people uh, because some have gotten second shots. Uh, number of patients hospitalized has uh, come down dramatically from 130,000 uh, uh, to about 90,000. Uh, there's there's 60, 55 million people older than the age of 65. So about 70 million doses could be administered over the next two months. About 35 million have already been given. That gets us up to about 100 million doses. Tony, is there light at the end of the tunnel? You know, Howard, I believe there really is, particularly since uh, we have, with regard to vaccines, right now, currently, as you and I are speaking, there still is much more demand than there is supply. When you get on the phone and you talk to many of the locations, particularly in the bigger cities, they can handle much more than what they have. But what will happen to make the light at the end of the tunnel even brighter is that as we get into the end of February, into March right. and April, there are going to be a lot more doses that are going to be available so that the discordance between supply and demand will be diminished. But things look like they're going in the right direction. We have less individual cases or infections per day. You know, there was a point when we were between three and 400,000 yeah, per day. Yeah. It's now between one and 200,000. And with that, obviously, will be the delayed effect, but the ultimate effect of diminution in hospitalizations and deaths. All of that is encouraging particularly in the situation where we're going to be getting more and more vaccines. One of the things that we have to be very transparent about, the challenge of the issue of variants. Right, that was going Namely, to be. the situation that we have, we already have the variants. We have the UK variant that is in now, I believe, over 40 states and several hundred people have been reported with it. Uh, the somewhat encouraging news there is that when you look at the impact of that on the protection of vaccines, it, mean, it seems to be minimal negative impact, although the virus itself, from the standpoint of its ability to transmit, is somewhere around 50% better transmissibility, which you know leads to more infections. Um, when you get to the South African uh, isolate, the B1351, uh, that is a bit more problematic. Because when you look at the relationship between the protection of antibodies induced by the vaccine, it's diminished somewhat. Although when you look at severe disease, namely hospitalization and deaths, the protection is still pretty good, even though the overall efficacy against the, vari uh, against the variant is diminished. Having said that as a background, uh, how would we have to watch very carefully and do things? People say, well, what can you do about the spread of a variant? When you have variants, both the UK and the South African, that have the capability of spreading more efficiently, they tend to become dominant. And if they're dominant, then you've got a problem with regard to both transmissibility, because they're, at least the UK one appears to be more transmissible. And then you have the issue with vaccines. You, you blunt that potential negative effect by vaccinating as many people as you possibly can as quickly as you can. 
Because as you and I know very well, viruses that love to mutate don't yeah. mutate unless they replicate. And if you can prevent them from replicating, either by vaccination or by public health measures, then you will diminish the potential of their mutating. So on the one hand, light at the end of the tunnel, things looking better. But on the other hand, we have a challenge that we have to address the evolution of these mutations. Tony, um, over the long run, and there's many questions, but over the next year or two, as we think about the vaccines being adopted, you know, Moderna and Pfizer have both announced they're watching carefully these new variants. Do, do you think at some point we're going to have to think about this as flu with with yearly vaccination or is it too early to say? I think, A, it's too early to say, Howard, but I think it is conceivable that some version of that will actually occur. Uh, we don't know about that. What we would hope to do um, would be to get the level of infection so low that the circulation of virus will not have the opportunity from season to season or year to year to essentially change. The one wild card in that that could be disruptive to that plan is that we need to look upon this globally because if you have a lot of replication going on in other countries of the world, that sooner or later, even though you take care of your own country with vaccinations, that mutants could tend to circulate in your society and diminish the protection of the vaccines you're using, which is a big, big plug for our trying as a global community to get vaccines to the developing world. Because if you can crush this virus throughout the world, you really won't give it any chance to evolve season by season with different mutations. So that's one of the reasons why I'm so pleased that we, A, rejoined the WHO, and right, B, are going right. to be part of the COVAX program. And as you know, I've said many, many times that I believe that rich countries, ourselves included, have a moral responsibility when you have a global outbreak like this, similar to what we did with HIV and PEPFAR to provide for the countries that don't have the resources or the capability of vaccinating their population to help them with aid, whether that be financial aid to get vaccines to them or supplementing their own ability to produce vaccines in a way that they could have the productive capability of doing that with cooperation from the pharmaceutical companies regarding relaxation of some of the patent situations. Bottom line, Howard, we've got to get the, the, the entire world vaccinated, not just our own country. Otherwise, every year there'll be another threat as more mutants come by. Tony, this notion of, of global vaccination, we know that both Moderna and Pfizer may be difficult in low and middle income countries for a host of different reasons. And then the, rep the reports from, from Russia on Sputnik, and then there has been a sense that uh, China is developing two different vaccines that may become world vaccines. Were you surprised about the Sputnik vaccine data that you've seen? No, I was I was happy about it. <laughs> you know, there's nothing. I mean, as I said in the beginning, before we even had any proof that any of the vaccines were if effective or safe, I would say there is absolutely not going to be one winner. This is not a race where whoever wins the race wins. This is we want everybody to get over the finish line and get a trophy. So if the Russians have a vaccine that's over 90% efficacious, wonderful, then they could take care of not only Russia, but maybe even some other needing countries. The same thing with the Chinese vaccine, the same thing with the vaccines that coming out of the UK, the AZ and the Oxford. I mean, successes on their part to me is just another step towards getting to where we want to be, namely having the global protection, not just individual developed nations. I think, Tony, you're, you're wearing the hat you, that you've worn for 
40 years, you're a globalist at heart uh, who believes in the health of the, of the planet and not just the United States. Tony, uh, some questions have already come in. Can you imagine any of those vaccines being approved and used in the U.S.? You know, I mean, obviously, theoretically, that is it could be the case. But if you look at the contractual arrangements that have been made by Operation Warp Speed months and months ago, I mean, if things work out well, just the contractual arrangements for 600 million doses that were made with Moderna and with Pfizer, you would have enough to vaccinate everybody in the United States as a backup. To supplement that, we also have contractual arrangements with J&J for at least 100 million doses by June. And we also have arrangements with Novavax. So, I mean, we, we do have backup. So I don't see, uh, at least not very clearly, the need to go beyond the contractual arrangements that we've already made and try to get vaccine from those other successful vaccines for example, the ones that are made in Russia. I don't really see any need for that right now. Tony, without doubt, um, uh, you know, people have always said clean water, hand washing uh, uh, vaccines lead the, are the top 10 public health measures of the last century. I think without doubt, uh, the scientific achievement of bringing a vaccine uh, to market in nine or 10 months has been extraordinary. But there have been increasing concerns that the same remarkable achievements around vaccine development, um, there's been more frustration around clinical advances, clinical treatments. I think we all know that corticosteroids remain uh, probably the standard of care, but vitamin D, ivermectin, convalescent plasma, interferon, uh, uh, all of the cascade blockers, there the, the data has been less clear, less clinical trials. Do you, what's your sense of advancement uh, for the clinical care of critically ill patients? Yeah, I mean, for critically ill patients, you're right. Something as simple and traditional as dexamethasone has been the most dramatic in diminishing the 28-day mortality, as well as some of the other uh, mediators or blunters of aberrant inflammation. Uh, the point that you make is one that is a significant issue to address, and that is when you look at treatment for early disease to avoid having to get in the hospital and to prevent serious disease and death, we don't have things that are knockout punches. You know, we mm -hmm. have monoclonal antibodies that are logistically difficult to get our arms around because they need to be given early, not when someone is already far advanced. And if you want to give it early, it's intravenous and you've got to, you know, have an infusion center or a hospital, which is almost paradoxical, if you know, or oxymoronic. You want to give it early, but you got to be in the hospital to get it, which really is, you know, the reason why you want to get sub-Q versions. Convalescent plasma, you know, works when people don't have very many antibodies, but when they start making their own antibodies, the convalescent plasma doesn't work as well. Um, so what we really need, and it's going to take a little while to get it done, but there may be some candidates that are already looking pretty good. We need, Howard, what we did with HIV and with hepatitis C. We need very effective, direct antiviral agents against SARS-CoV-2, very similar to what we did with combination chemotherapy and combination, not chemotherapy, but antiretroviral mm -hmm. therapy for HIV. That's what we really need. We may have some already in the pipeline that are being early tested, but we need a concerted effort for the targeted development of anti-coronavirus drugs so that when someone gets infected and gets mild symptoms, a sore throat, a stuffy nose, that when you treat them, that's it. The virus is suppressed completely and you have no more problem. That's really what we need. I mean, you could talk about monoclonal antibodies and convalescent plasma and hyperimmune globulin. All that does have a place. But my, my vision for that would be a Z-pack for mm. 
for a, right. a coronavirus, namely a package of five to 10 days worth of treatment of a direct anti-coronavirus antiviral. That's really what we need. Tony, there had been, and a couple of the questions, uh, you, you know, about uh, spacing out the vaccines beyond the three and four weeks. I, I think you've spoken pretty clearly about uh, that, as has Paul Offit, Peter Piot, who is in the UK and is not very happy with their decision. Uh, I, my sense is you think the U.S. will stick with the three and four four week schedule. Is that an accurate statement? That is very accurate. Yes, we stick with the science. The science is very clear that in the trials that we did with Moderna and Pfizer, 21 days with Pfizer, 28 days with Moderna. The data show a 94 to 95% efficacy. And that, you know, even though there are going to be situations where there will be some people for logistic reasons alone may not hit it exactly on day 21 or exactly on day 28, you want to give them under extreme circumstances some wiggle room. So if they get it a week or two weeks later, okay. But when you're talking about months later, even though that could be true, the data don't back that yet, at least not with our platform. Now, there are other platforms like the AZ, which is saying that it's OK to wait that long. Well, that's with a different platform than the one that we're dealing with. So you got to make sure you make your decisions based on the data that's associated with that particular platform. Tony, now that vaccines have arrived, um, the theoretical uh, benefit of giving them to pregnant women and children has come up. It crosses my desk now almost every day. Uh, I was stunned by the World Health Organization's announcement last week about um, uh, uh, the contraindication, I think, of M Moderna uh, in pregnant women, which yesterday they withdrew. Right. Um, and uh, we still don't uh, have much data about children and adolescents. So children, adolescents, pregnant women, so-called protected groups, traditionally protected groups, uh, more and more questions about, uh, about safety in pregnant women. What's your sense about children, adolescents, pregnant women? Okay, let's take pregnant women first. Obviously, as you know, with almost all vaccine trials, that pregnant women initially are excluded as an exclusion criteria. So with the data that showed the efficacy and safety in both the vaccines that we're using now, the Moderna Pfizer, they were excluded. But ever since the EUAs were issued, there have been now over 10,000 pregnant women who wow. have said and have been in the trials. Okay. The FDA, as part of the typical follow-up you have following the initial uh, um, issuing of an EUA, have found thus far, and we got to be careful, but thus far, no red flags about that, about pregnant women. Interestingly, many of the pregnant women were healthcare providers who were exposed to COVID, to SARS-CoV-2 and said, I would rather take my chances with a vaccine than getting infected while I'm pregnant because of the uh, adverse uh, effect and adverse outcome on pregnancy. So what is going on right now is that with regard to children, we are doing what we do traditionally. We're doing an age de-escalation studies that we've already started and are going to go from 16 to 12, 12 to seven or whatever it is, right down the line. So it is likely that within the next few months, as we get into the spring and the early summer, we will get data from the studies in children that we'll be able to use for safety and immunogenicity, and then hopefully do bridge studies to the efficacy in adults. We will not have to do 30,000 to 44,000 person efficacy trials at each age group. We'll do an age de-escalation primary in the sense of phase one, phase 2A, to get through those age groups to show that it's safe and that it does induce the appropriate immune response. Tony, uh, going back a bit, uh, with respect to the variants, we have mRNA vaccines. We're certainly going to have adenovirus vaccines. Um, uh, China, uh, obviously, is a more uh, traditional route. Is it likely that any of these vaccines will be the, the form, the type, will be more or less likely to be affected by the variants? Or is it just 
you have to test each vaccine to understand yeah. uh, potential consequences of new variants. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, you don't want to get ahead of yourself or the data, but I can tell you that I'm fit. I don't want to use the word confident. That sometimes is presumptive. I, I feel that it is extremely likely that each of these platforms that are used will be faced with variants that do not get completely suppressed with the vaccine induced antibodies that you're talking about. And the reason for that is common sense, Howard, because when you make a vaccine, most of them are directed to the spike protein. So right. you are going to pick a spike protein that's going to have a certain amino acid content and a certain uh, configuration. That's going to be your vaccine. Sooner or later, the virus, which is replicating and mutating out there, is going to evade that. Whether you do it with an ad uh, vector, whether you do it with an mRNA, uh. or whether you do it with a soluble protein, you still have a fixed immunogen and a virus that's changing. So when you match a fixed immunogen with a virus that's changing, sooner or later, you're going to get a mutant that evades that. Tony, I, it's been a long year for the country and the world, and it, it, it's been a, a long year for you. Uh, I think you know, you've been an extraordinary spokesperson for science and medicine. Are you looking forward to the nationals taking the field again in D.C.? <laughs> Very much so. Um, I, I really am. I hope that there will at least be at least be some limited stadium see, seating in the summer. Uh, I'm not so sure about the spring yet, but at least in the summer, I would hope that by the time we get into May, June, July, that we will have enough people vaccinated in the country that the level of infection would be low enough, maybe not yet total herd immunity, but low enough to say that we can go to a game, you know, wear a mask, but be seated, not sitting right next to each other. For those of you who don't know the Washington Nationals, it's usually pretty crowded in the stadium because we generally have a very good team. But but yes, I'm... Uh, I'm looking forward to that. That's one of the sources of my relaxation. There's a certain something, a certain rhythm of a baseball game that some people think it may be too slow, but to me it's very soothing. Do you want another you do you want another go at throwing out the pitch, the first pitch? I I I th I think you should get a redo. What do you think? I I'm I'm hoping that they give me the chance to do that, Howard. It was quite embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just read one uh, one quote uh, for for close. My eighty four year and a half old parents have had both of their Fauci ouchies. Thank you, Doctor Fauci. You are a national treasure, um, Tony. Once again, uh, thanks so much for joining me. This is Howard Bachner, editor in chief of JAMA. I've been uh, joined today by uh, Tony Fauci, uh, director of the NIAID, Dean, along with Vivek Murthy and Rochelle Walensky, uh, heads up the Biden administration's physician leadership around the COVID-19 pandemic. Tony, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Howard. It's always good to be with you. And for Thank all you. our listeners, uh, tomorrow we're going to do evolutionary biology, uh, talking about the variants uh, with Adam Loring from the University of Michigan. Thanks, Tony. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.